The discussion about TTIP, the free trade agreement between Europe and the USA, has exploded. Weil ich nicht einsehe, dass irgendwelche Staaten mehr Macht kriegen über unsere Gerichte, über unser Rechtssystem und das aushebeln wollen. Perhaps the most acute breaking point in the TTIP negotiations is ISDS. Investor State Dispute Settlement. With ISDS, foreign companies can sue a country. By means of new laws and regulations, multinationals finding their profits under threat can claim billions of dollars from national governments. If ISDS remains included in TTIP, Europe and the Netherlands will be vulnerable to the American claim culture. Thanks to the small print in a trade agreement. This is Backlight. Welcome to the Free Trade Zone. When we say free trade, we think of goods being traded without limitations. No more hours of waiting at customs, no tariff wars, no import duties or bureaucracy, so goods can travel quickly from A to B. But is this a realistic image of free trade? How free is free trade? In Cambridge, renowned economist Ha Jun Chang has been researching this issue. He has found out that the image of free trade can change radically within a few generations. Basically, free trade should mean that everything should be for sale. So child labor, human beings as slaves, government jobs, human organs, why not? I mean, there's nothing in economic theory that says, well, this uh, should be sold, shouldn't be sold. Go back 200 years in America, if you advocated abolition of slavery, the best, uh, well, kindest uh, description you would have got is unrealistic. Free trade is a fiction. Even the freest free trade agreement will be subject to hard-won social values. So the definition of a free market will always be a subject of political discussion. The definition of the free market is a fundamentally political thing because it's only because you have adopted certain ethical positions and political views that now no one even thinks of the ban on child labor as a regulation on the market. You know, the boundary has been redrawn. So drawing that boundary that itself is a political act. And uh, you have to realize that, that uh, you can say, oh, we should uh, uh, have free trade, free market. But actually, when you try to put it into practice, it's not clear where the boundary should uh, lie. We no longer accept slave trade and child labor as part of the global chain of commerce. The borders of free trade have shifted through the ages. And these borders are even now under constant pressure. Worldwide, societies strive for the inclusion of healthy working conditions and the protection of the environment into the rules of the free market. But how important are these values in our free trade agreements? We're going to Canada. In 1992, this country signed a free trade agreement with the USA, NAFTA. For many Canadians, NAFTA had unforeseen consequences. Gérard, on, on va aller où? Nous allons aller au puits de Saint-Denis sur Richelieu, à 2 km d'ici. 
c'est très près de votre maison, hein? C'est à 2 km à vol d'oiseau. Ça te, ça te fait peur? Euh, heureusement, ils n'ont pas encore fracturé ce puits. Mais c'est euh, préoccupant pour euh, les personnes qui demeurent dans le boisé euh, tout près. Mais, mais pas pour vous? Pour moi, oui, également. Parce que la partie horizontale, s'ils le font dans quelques temps, euh, pourrait venir jusqu'à ma maison. Comme vous voyez, il n'y a pas de protection. N'importe qui peut arriver et aller jusqu'au puits. Même les barrières sont par terre. Alors, comme vous voyez, c'est le puits de Lone Pine Resources. C'est en milieu d'un champ de soya. On a du maïs également. Euh, toute personne peut s'approcher, il n'y a aucune sécurité. Lone Pine is an energy company that wants to release gas in Quebec by fracturing the ground, also known as fracking. Gérard Montpetit, a retired teacher, didn't know what was happening when Lone Pine arrived in his backyard. In uh, 2010, I, uh, I didn't know anything about shale gas or fracturing. And uh, when I first heard of it, it was already happening here in my backyard in my own municipality. So uh, it was a total shock because here in Quebec, we were, the history books always said we we have hydroelectric power, but we don't have any petroleum. So it was a total change of paradigm. We didn't know what this was all about. And it, it came on very suddenly with no, like a, a thunderclap on a bright afternoon. Gérard Montpetit felt ambushed by shale gas company Lone Pine. This company found all kinds of new ways to make money in Canada, thanks to NAFTA, the free trade agreement between the USA and Canada. NAFTA made it possible for Lone Pine to expand its opportunities enormously without having to drill one centimeter. So, Mr. Archimbault, where are we now? Right now we're on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River which is the largest river, estuary, and gulf system in the world. It's a very beautiful place, and it's, it's the art of Quebec, the lifeline. Quebec was constructed, was built around this river. So for us, it's, it's capital, it's a very important river. For years, Sylvain Archimbault has been fighting to protect Canada's most important river. Even he was surprised by the shale gas company's sheer creativity. What's at stake here, then? At stake here is uh, a, a company has a, a, a permit, a license. It had a license to drill uh, in the river and also underneath the riverbed uh, to go look for uh, shale gas. But in the meantime, the Quebec government, they revoked all the, the, the permits. After a scientific report saying that drilling underneath the St. Lawrence River was not a good idea, the drilling permits were revoked. This was a unanimous decision made by the Parliament of Quebec, but Lone Pine didn't leave it at that. Thanks to NAFTA, the trade agreement between Canada and the US, the energy company was able to submit a claim to the Canadian government. Not drilling for shale gas, but exploiting the small print in the free trade agreement was the way to make money. This was made possible by the inclusion of a special clause in the agreement that protected the interests of investors, ISDS. Kunchak Chai, what is ISDS? These four letters are becoming increasingly important. I stands for investor. The first S stands for stead. D is dispute or conflict. And the last S is settlement or resolving the conflict. ISDS is the mechanism enabling companies to sue countries. 
multinationals can lay claims with governments for sums amounting to billions of dollars. Lone Pine claims that by revoking the permit to drill here, they uh, lose money on their investment. Exactly. They said they were unfairly treated. I have here this, uh, the, the, the case, the Lone Pine investor against the government of Canada. Maybe you could read why they feel mistreated. Lone Pine notifies Canada of its intent to bring an arbitration for the arbitrary capricious and illegal revocation of the enterprise's valuable right to mine for oil and gas under the St. Lawrence River, without compensation and with no cognizable public purpose. Barb Shepard? Yes, you speak with Roland Wong from VPO Television. Hi, Roland. Hello. It's about the Lone Pine versus the Government of Canada case. Unfortunately, we're not at liberty to talk about it. Our client did not give us permission. They wait for every part of the deal to settle before they give um, full permission. Lone Pine is not the only company that went for the Canadian government. The inclusion of ISDS in the free trade agreement with the US meant the Canadians were vulnerable to dozens of claims by American investors, mostly regarding raw materials and the environment. Canada's faced uh, many claims because Canada is the uh, Western developed country that has given up the most of its sovereignty to ISDS. Gus Van Harten teaches investment law at the York University of Toronto. He is known as one of the few independent ISDS lawyers. He was the first to warn against the risks of this arbitration system. Because Canada agreed to ISDS with the United States, and Canada, in fact, is the only Western developed country ever to have agreed to ISDS with the United States. So for the last 20 years, we have the dubious honor of uh, the, being the Western country that's the most exposed to ISDS claims. And so in Canada's case, uh, we are uh, the fourth or fifth most sued country in the world. Uh, including all of the developing countries and transition countries and so on. After the ratification of the Free Trade Agreement, Canada became one of the most sued countries in the world. So a free trade agreement can have consequences that reach much further than just the lifting of import duties. Most people think of trade agreements as being about reduction of tariffs. Free trade is, is trading and not having tariff walls. If trade agreements these days were about only that, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be criticizing them. You would never have heard of me, okay? I come on the scene because of this profound uh, push of so-called trade into all kinds of new domains which touch upon democracy, which touch upon the courts, which touch upon public budgets in a way that your conventional trade agreement doesn't even come close to doing. The investment chapters in trade agreements, and ISDS in particular, at the heart of that. Okay? This is about changing fundamentally the power structures in countries, shifting power from legislatures, governments, and courts to foreign investors and a small group of private lawyers who get appointed repeatedly as arbitrators. The TTIP is uh, not really about uh, trade. You know, already there's very little trade barrier between the North America and uh, Europe. Yeah? I mean, okay, there are sectors like agriculture where there's some protection, but uh, in industrial uh, sector, you know, the, the average tariff rate of uh, countries in uh, Europe and North America are around 3%. I mean, it's uh, insignificant. Yeah? So you are already engaged in free trade. 
And uh, the essence of TTIP is uh, not really about trade. It's about uh, uh, increasing protection of uh, the intellectual property rights, like uh, patents. It's uh, about uh, giving corporations to the power to sue national governments in the, on the ground that uh, their regulation has uh, reduced uh, expected profit. Yeah? Increasing corporate power is uh, really at the core of TTIP. Van Harten and Ha Jun Chang say that trade agreements, including ISDS, give multinationals too much power. The investment clauses in the agreements make it possible for multinationals to sue a government whenever they feel unfairly treated. Bird of prey, bird of prey. You could see it like this. Predatory American capitalists threaten our democracy. Little Tom Thumb is trodden underfoot by the giant. But in the global ISDS game, one small country is actually very big in ISDS. The Netherlands. All over the world, hundreds of billions are invested through the Netherlands. Doing business with the Dutch is a pleasure because they have tax agreements with many countries. This enables multinationals to avoid taxation with post office box constructions. Um, ik heb de verdragen um, met um, Irak, Azerbeidzjan, um, Marokko en VAE. De Verenigde, Verenigde Arabische Emiraten, precies. Ja. We are talking to Nikos Lavranos. He has negotiated several agreements on behalf of the Dutch. Heeft Nederland veel investeringsverdragen met de rest van de wereld? Uh, Nederland heeft uh, bijna 100 uh, investeringsverdragen. Uh, dus uh, vrijwel de hele wereld is afgedekt. Met 100 investeringsverdragen is de wereld afgedekt wel? Althans, de wereld, uh, zover het belangrijk is voor Nederlandse economie en Nederlandse investeerders. Nederland hoort bij de top 5 van landen die um, wat de aantal uh, verdragen betreft wereldwijd. Daar is uh, bewust de afgelopen decennia ook het beleid op afgestemd. Wat ik weet is dat Nederland, in ieder geval uh, het ministerie van Economische Zaken, een speerpunt heeft. En dat heeft uh, hoofdkantoorbeleid. En we hebben een uh, specifieke agency daarvoor die specifiek uh, niks anders doet dan buitenlandse investeerders, buitenlandse bedrijven hier naar Nederland te halen. Everyone knows that the Netherlands facilitates tax evasion for multinationals. But they also have a main office policy and they close agreements that protect investors worldwide. How does this work? In eerste instantie gaat het erom dat die twee landen elkaar als het ware diep in de ogen kijken en Afspreken, we gaan elkaars investeerders fatsoenlijk behandelen. This is not just an official royal visit. We mean business. And we've brought the business leaders to prove it. This is yes, but I want it all, so I get it all. I wanna eat the whole cake. I'm not sharing, I'm not sharing. You should have learned how to bake. Yes, I want it all, so I get it all. I wanna eat the whole cake. I'm not sharing, I'm not sharing. You should have learned bitches love cake. cake. Dutch industrial leaders and royals travel all over the world, closing agreements which include far reaching investor protection schemes. Benefits from ISDS are incorporated into these agreements. A lot of people have said to me when I've talked to people about ISDS, people who don't understand it or haven't heard of it before and I explain what it is, they say, I get why corporations want it, but why would a state want it? This is Matt Kennard, a journalist. He has studied countries that have seen the shadow side of the free market. He wrote a book about it, The Racket. 
Kennard found out that many countries receiving claims from substantial investors regretted having made these investment treaties. But why were so many investment treaties signed in the past 30 years? These bilateral investment treaties which activate ISDS were seen as a, a form of diplomatic goodwill. So a new, uh, a new prime minister or a new foreign minister would go to um, Germany or go to Britain and they'll be have a nice state dinner and they'll be told, oh, look, just sign here, we're, we're friends now. We, uh, th this is just a, a bit of polite uh, diplomatic goodwill. Uh, and what happened was years later they realised, oh, God, what have we signed? When they started getting hit with case after case. So it was like, well, Mr. Minister, you're visiting, so here's a cultural cooperation treaty and here's a foreign investment promotion treaty. Who would be against foreign investment promotion? Little does he know that in 10 years, the country may be on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars because he put his signature on that piece of paper at a photo op. With the help of the investment treaties that the Netherlands has so eagerly closed worldwide, you can sue the world from a postbox holding company in Amsterdam. Because of this provision of legal services, Dutch companies are second only to American enterprises in issuing the largest number of ISDS claims. And because of their expertise in the field of international arbitration, ISDS cases are a welcome addition to the Dutch economy. If anyone's seen the movies um, about Jason Bourne and the Bourne identity, he's the super agent who goes and he has stashed away various passports from different countries. And when he wants to go and do something in Russia, he goes and finds the Russian passport and he takes that and he becomes Russian. And one day he wants to be French, so he goes finds the French passport and uses that instead. Well, that's what foreign investors' lawyers are doing with ISDS. One day they're in a certain country because they want to produce there. Another day it's they're in another country because they want the resources. Another day, for tax reasons, they're from the Cayman Islands. And then another day they're from Holland because they want to access ISDS in a Dutch treaty. Boring trade agreements have become a Jason Bourne movie. Americans are becoming Dutch and Canadians are becoming Americans. In the NAFTA agreement, there's a clause that says that a foreign company can sue the Canadian government. Uh, this clause doesn't concern Canadian companies. Lone Pine is actually a Canadian company based in, uh, in Alberta. But they have a head office in, uh, in Delaware, United States. So they have a very, very small office and they are registered in the United States. So that's why they were, uh, based on that, they could sue the government of Canada. The Dutch government facilitates creative lawyers but the Americans also mean business. The majority of legal actions against governments are made by American investors, but the American government is being sued by companies as well. And so far, the United States has never lost a case. It's been sued about 18 times by Canadian investors under NAFTA and has never lost. That's a remarkably successful record. Um, I can't say that it demonstrates conclusive evidence of any kind of bias. Uncle Sam has never lost an ISDS case. There is no official explanation for this, but most cases do take place in Washington, D.C., in a back room of the World Bank. This institution grants loans to countries in need, but it also helps decide which arbitrators are appointed to ISDS cases. Uh, one of the things that happens is an executive official has the power to decide which arbitrator will decide which case in various circumstances. Who is the executive official? Typically it's an official at the World Bank. The World Bank tends to be, is fairly described as being more in the political orbit of the United States than, than any other country. So if a, if a foreign investor is bringing a claim against the United States, 
and the ultimate decision who the arbitrator will be, if they can't agree on who the arbitrator should, will be, is made by this World Bank official. I mean, at least that gives a basis for doubt as to the independence and partiality of the process. The World Bank Tribunal is called ICSID, and here, three men get to decide on claims of billions of dollars. What is ICSID? ICSID is the International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes. It's the fifth arm of the World Bank. And what it is, is, is where most of these ISDS cases are seen. What's interesting is that it's such an important institution, yet no one knows it. That's what I find fascinating about ICSID. I didn't know much about it before I started on this project and yet billions of dollars changes hands based on rulings given at this body. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, exit case number ARB 0912, and we now start the first day of this jurisdiction hearing. We need our hope... This is where conflicts between investors and governments are solved. At exit, the investor chooses an arbitrator. Good afternoon, my name is Arif Ali and I'm appearing on behalf of uh, the claimant. <clears throat> and the country being sued chooses one. I'm Derek Smith of Dewey and LaBeouf here on behalf of the Republic of El Salvador. These two arbitrators, often together with the World Bank, choose a president. And so accordingly we give the floor to the respondent for its opening presentation this morning. Uh, Mr. President, members of the tribunal, we are before you to present El Salvador's oral statement on its objection to jurisdiction. These three arbitrators are often renowned investment lawyers. Between the three of them, they decide on the fate of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. El Salvador's primary objection is that the Canadian company Pacific Rim Mining Corp has abused the international arbitration process by manipulation of the corporate form to change the na nationality of Pacific Rim Cayman to permit it to assert jurisdiction as a national of the United States in this arbitration. The actual measure at issue here is the practice of the government of El Salvador in direct contravention of the country's laws to withhold permits and concessions in furtherance of the exploitation of metallic mining investments. A Western multinational taking a former colony to court. This is a typical ISDS case. So you had Veolia, the, the French um, water company, uh, suing Egypt for raising the minimum wage. Uh, and you had uh, Pacific Rim, which is now Oceana, which was bought by Oceana Gold, taking El Salvador to ICSID for not granting them an environmental permit for a gold mine. The arbitration system has turned out to be a continuation of the old colonial politics, now by legal means. In the 60s, a group of businessmen got together and they said, look, with the decolonization movement, um, which was happening at a fast clip then, lots of African nations were getting their independence. Uh, India had got their independence 20 years previously. They thought, well, we need another system that ensures that we can keep our investments secure without having to use the military, etc. So they came up with this legal system. So Western European countries designed this arbitration system to protect their assets in the former colonies once the colonies obtained their independence. And they were particularly concerned about uh, these historical expropriations. So they designed a very aggressive um, legal process to protect those assets in a way that was very favorable to the foreign investor because the foreign investor was the European company and so on. And these treaties worked one way. They worked to discipline developing countries, newly independent countries, transition countries, and so on. This was the intention of ISDS. No more gunboats or army troops, but shrewd clauses in investment treaties to secure our interests in former colonies. But now, our former colonies won't accept it any longer. One lawsuit really changed the game in South Africa, and that was um, a case where a Italian um, oligarch called Foresti uh, and his, comp his granite companies took the South African government to ICSID for um, 
uh, for their post-apartheid black empowerment policies. Zuid-Afrika is een specifiek geval in die zin dat Zuid-Afrika um, een bepaald beleid, uh, namelijk het black empowerment uh, beleid, uh, door wil voeren of doorvoert. Dat wil zeggen dat dus bedrijven die door blanken gerund worden of eigendom zijn van blanken, um, dat daar uh, zwarte, donkere uh, Zuid-Afrikanen in de plaats uh, moeten komen. 26% of all shares of, of mining companies should be given to historically disadvantaged South Africans, which means black people, because they've been locked out of their, their own wealth for decades. Dus dat leidt tot onteigening. Um, en uh, dat heeft ook geleid tot een aantal zaken. Um, want het gaat om discriminatie. Maar worden de blanken dan gediscrimineerd? Begrijp ik dat goed dan? Elke discriminatie is verboden. Um, dus het maakt niks uit. Het punt is, er wordt nu gediscrimineerd... waardoor nu blijkbaar blanke investeerders... dat die last van krijgen en schade ondervinden. Het did become een issue in South Africa because it was such a violation of their sovereignty and the, the, the sovereignty of the government, the democratic government, to make legislation in the favor of the people was obviously not they weren't able to do that. To Matt Kennard, it's crystal clear. ISDS stands in the way of the emancipation of new economies. So South Africa became very, even the government became very interested in looking at how they could escape the system because they saw that it wasn't really providing them anything. They had given away the shop without really much in return. So they are now in the process of cancelling their BITs. The South African government wants to have a say in the exploitation of its natural resources. But Western companies use ISDS as a weapon in the battle for vital raw materials. Many arbitration cases are about mines, oil and gas. Canada has been the historical punching bag because we're the only ones who've allowed it. And we're now the fourth or fifth most sued country in the world. So does that mean if the Netherlands agrees to ISS with the United States, do you think you're that different from Canada that somehow you're not going to be sued? ExxonMobil from America is a shareholder in the Dutch gas fields. The Dutch haven't got an investment treaty with the US yet. But if TTIP goes through, ExxonMobil's lawyers will keep a close eye on them should the Dutch decide to turn off the gas tap. What have you nodig om ook in een geval van een koude winter, want je kunt toch nou niet voorstellen, maar het kan echt weer dat er een koude winter is. Het is ook niet goed om net te doen alsof 85 de enige koude winter was en dat het daarna iedere keer um, uh, een warme winter was. We hebben sindsdien zes, zeven koude winters gehad en de laatste was, uh, was in, in het jaar 2013. Dus er zijn voortdurend uh, koude winters. Je moet rekening houden met uh, koude winters. En dat betekent, ik vraag dan uh, rekening houden met de mogelijkheid van een koude winter. Wat is dan wat je hier uh, nodig hebt? En, ja, uiteindelijk, ik kan de mensen niet in de kou laten staan. Dus dat wij daar willen zijn weer het risico nemen, dat is, ja, dat, 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 dat is, dat staat gewoon haaks op de werkelijkheid. Het is zo dat er bedrijven zijn die op, op uh, hele legale wijze op dit moment aardgas als grondstof gebruiken. Ja, wij kunnen niet zomaar die, die, uh, die, die knop omdraaien en zeggen tegen de bedrijven, bekijk het maar, zo werkt dat niet. Is dit je eerste spandoek? Hoe, hoe kom je erbij om een spandoek te maken? Uh... Door alle uh, gedraai en gekonkel en bijna leugens en net niet leugens van uh, de NAM is hem op een gegeven moment uh, tot daar gekomen. En dan, uh, dan neem je de kwast in de hand. Hebben we nog meer van ons Groningsgas nodig dan uh, liever niet hier. Het uh, kost... De bewoners op dit moment veel te veel. Niet alleen uh, financieel, maar ook geestelijk. Uh, ergens moet het stoppen en dan is het genoeg. genoeg.
With ISDS, citizens who suffer from national government decisions will now have another opponent, the American investor. And while the Netherlands and Europe are about to dive headlong into the ISDS adventure with the USA, countries south of the equator want to get rid of it. Holland's former colony, Indonesia, is fed up with post office box claims from Amsterdam and ended their investment treaty with the Netherlands this year. It's quite interesting to see uh, countries like Indonesia, South Africa, a few others actually uh, having the, I would say, backbone to pull out of ISDS. Nikos Lavranos left the foreign ministry for the private sector. He is now the head of legal affairs at Global Investment Protection. He is convinced that without a treaty that includes ISDS, countries will attract far fewer investors. Kunt u begrijpen dat Indonesië de investeringsverdragen wil opzeggen? Ik denk dat het op lange termijn niet slim is. Want ik denk dat daardoor um, investeerders onzeker worden um, en daardoor hun investeringen terug gaan schroeven en in andere landen gaan investeren. Um, dus ik denk op lange termijn um, heeft Indonesië hier eerder een probleem dan dat het een oplossing is. So, no investment without ISDS. That's what many supporters of this parallel legal system say. But studies show that companies find other matters more important than ISDS. There are studies that ask, uh, say, CEOs of uh, major international companies, what are the factors that you look at when you decide whether or, you, uh, whether or not you want to invest in this country? The most important thing they say actually is uh, the the size and the growth of the market. Yeah? This is what that, that, that makes China so attractive. Yeah? 1.3 billion people growing at 7% uh, per year, you know. I mean, that's where you want to be, you know. Some other small, stagnant economy might give you all the protection in the world. Why would you go there? Yeah? So the, that's the most important. The second most important thing is that the quality of infrastructure and labor force. Yeah? This is where, for example, countries like Singapore have succeeded. Yeah? Because Singapore, I mean, uh, has uh, uh, used uh, foreign investment uh, on a massive scale. But uh, they didn't just say, well, please come and exploit us. Yeah? A country like Indonesia is looking at pulling out of the treaties because it's the light bulb has gone on. We signed these treaties before we were aware of the risks and liabilities. Uh, then came the explosion of claims. Now we get hit with uh, a damaging lawsuit and ask ourselves, why did we allow this in the first place? Many countries think twice before signing up for ISDS. Australia doesn't have an ISDS treaty with the US, and Brazil doesn't want it included in new agreements. Neem Brazilië bijvoorbeeld. Ja. Land, in dat land wordt stevig geïnvesteerd. Ja. En daar, daar is ook niet. Uh, zij nemen ook geen ISDS uh, op in hun uh, investeringsverdragen met andere landen. Uh, nee, dat klopt zo niet. Uh, Brazilië heeft die verdragen ook trouwens met Nederland niet geratificeerd. Maar daar zat gewoon ISDS in. Er is gewoon een politieke keuze gemaakt om uiteindelijk deze verdragen niet te ratificeren. Uh, dus dat maar dat geen... betekent toch dat ze dan eigenlijk niet echt geldig zijn, toch? Nee, ze zijn niet in werking. Maar ik wil alleen maar zeggen dat in beginsel Brazilië wel uh, voor ISDS gekozen heeft. Uh, en aan het einde gezegd heeft, nee, dat doen we niet. Ja, dus eigenlijk vinden ze ISDS nog steeds te veel macht geven aan investeerders dan? Als ze ISDS toch er buiten willen laten in hun investeringsverdragen? Ik denk dat zij uh, de ruimte willen houden om, als ze het nodig achten, maatregelen te nemen... Zoals nationaliseringen, uh, die ook uh, buitenlandse investeerders kunnen treffen en willen voorkomen 
um, dat dit via internationale arbitrage tot claims gaat leiden. Brazil wants to set as sovereign a course as possible without being hindered by claims. Canada no longer has that freedom. Het is nu wel zo dat sinds Canada in een vrijhandelsverdrag zit met de Verenigde Staten en Mexico in NAFTA, dat Canada vanaf dat moment een van de meest aangeklaagde landen is geworden. Heeft u daar een verklaring voor? Nou ja, dat duidt dus erop uh, uh, dat Canada, uh, en met name als ik het goed zie, de provincies, uh, vaak uh, maatregelen nemen op een manier uh, die niet conform een NAFTA-verdrag is. Dat is dus uh, nogmaals uh, uh, een teken daarvan uh, dat het misschien toch niet zo uh, goed bestuur uh, in dat land uh, op alle niveaus uh, kennelijk... Uh, um, dat het daar niet uh, bestaat. Is Canada een banana republic? Canada is not a banana republic, although some promoters of ISDS would uh, have you believe that, uh, because of course they want to sell ISDS as necessary even in a country like Canada. There's so much more money to go after in a developed country. The budgets are so much bigger. So for a range of factors, you can expect claims. The Western world is the latest hunting ground for ISDS. Richer countries can pay higher claims. The number of claims are increasing and the payments are getting bigger and bigger. ISDS is like a happy hunting ground for clever lawyers. So five years ago, no one was talking about having cases that involve billions of dollars. But in the last five years, we have had cases involving many cases involving tens of billions of dollars in disputed assets, and we have awards that have run into the billions of dollars. What it is now is a way to make money, and a very good sign of that is the rise of third-party financing, which are these um, investment funds, which are, their whole business model is to invest in claims against states, because there's so much money to be made. ESDS sorgt for a happy hunting ground for investment lawyers. Nee, natuurlijk niet, want geen investeerder staat ochtends op en zegt van goh, laat ik vandaag maar even land X of Z aanklagen. Dat is volstrekt onzin. The case against Ecuador where Occidental Petroleum, the Houston-based oil company, uh, won 1.8 billion dollars, which is the same as Ecuador's budget for its health, uh, for its citizens for a year. They won that. So when you're talking about figures that big, obviously investment funds are going to be interested. And what they often say is, um, we will invest in your claim if you give us a cut of the eventual award. And they're called non-recourse loans. So these companies take the loan and then don't have to pay it back if they lose. Er schijnt de laatste jaren sprake van te zijn dat er ook zelfs wordt geïnvesteerd in uh, ISDS-zaken. Weet u daarvan? Nee, dat uh, is uh, nieuw voor mij. Uh, een ander uh, aspect is dat wat je hebt, third party fonden, dat dus investeerders zijn die een claim mede gaan financieren. Voor investeerders die net niet genoeg geld hebben om zo'n dure investeringsarbitrage uh, tot het einde door te zetten. ISDS has turned out to be a Pandora's box with unforeseen consequences. It has now impacted developed constitutional states. 
Where their populations and politicians want protection for the environment, ISDS provides multinationals with ways to fight them on it. Every uh, member of parliament, all the parties unanimously voted to revoke those, those licenses. So it, it was a consensus, a social consensus in Quebec to revoke them. Everybody said it, it's, it's a no-brainer, like we say, this should be protected. So, what does that say of, uh, of the state of our democracy? <laughs> it, uh, it, it, it could be shaken up by foreign commercial interests who uh, sometimes are very powerful and they could put pressure on a democratically elected government saying somehow, hey, don't take that decision because we have the power to sue you in the end. You have a change in how governments operate. They give a much greater attention to the foreign investors' interests than to the interests of others in the country, in certain cases. Uh, the institutional structure changes. So governments will put in special assessment processes for new laws and new regulations to see how will this affect foreign investors, U.S. investors in particular. Oh, we might run the risk of a claim. We could be at, on the hook for a lot of money. It would be politically embarrassing to the government. So let's not do that anymore. I can me well that you as a government op een gegeven moment ook denkt van nou we zouden dat misschien kunnen doen maar het risico op een claim is aanwezig laten we het maar niet doen en er zijn ook onderzoekers die die op wijzen dat dat die regulatory chill ook plaatsvindt dat wordt altijd gezegd maar ik heb het nooit echt gezien het is nooit aangetoond dat zijn anekdotische verhalen dat mogelijk um, dat zou gebeurd zijn maar het is uh, naar mijn weten nooit echt aangetoond dat een overheid gezegd heeft of laat zien I have not done it because I am afraid of a claim. When we were researching ISDS, we got through the Freedom of Information Act um, documents from the Guatemalan government, which was about a gold mine, which had been was very controversial because of the environmental effects and health effects for the local population. And they wanted to basically cancel the, the, the mine and withdraw the permit. Um, and within the documents that we got, within the government when they were discussing the case, many of the people were talking about, well, if we cancel it, it's going to make us vulnerable to an ISDS case. So it was a massive consideration for a sovereign government on making a decision about the health of their citizens. And in the end, the mine stayed open. So you have this massive way of levering uh, sovereign governments into not doing policies by just threatening them with ISDS cases. Nee, ik denk dat dat echt een uh, geconstrueerd argument is. Uh, ik denk nogmaals heel duidelijk, als je kijkt um, hoe zo'n arbitragezaak loopt uh, en wat de voorwaarden daarvoor zijn. Um, nogmaals, als de overheid redelijk en fatsoenlijk handelt, um, net zoals Nederland, uh, is er helemaal geen probleem. Dus ik zie dat uh, probleem niet. Nee. It's very um, uh, scary that you're political decision, the decisions that you take for, for the public, the, the wealth of the public, the well-being of the public, they can be contested by a foreign company for a huge amount of money. So are we free to act for the well-being of our nation or are we subjected to decisions or pressure that comes from outside? <laughs>